and two of them agree uh, that it occurred specifically in February or March 1979. Therefore, just on the face of it, this event took place at least several months after the telegram was sent in June 1979. It's also not established at all that the dead witness Chang Se, who the co-prosecutors emphasized in their oral argument, was talking about the group of Jarai mentioned uh, in the telegram either. In short, there is nothing linking witness accounts of Jarai at Wukansai in this telegram about this such incident. Furthermore, the telegram specifically mentions 209 people. The witnesses, however, spoke only very vaguely about, quote-unquote, some people. It clearly cannot be concluded beyond reasonable doubt that the telegram and the three witnesses were describing the same group of Jarai people. In any event, while the witnesses speculated that those Jarai were killed as they never saw them again, none of them actually witnessed any killings. Likewise, the telegram simply mentions the arrest of people. And specifically, the telegram shows that the reason for the alleged arrest of the 209 people was their suspected involvement in espionage. Again, let me emphasize, those people were coming from Vietnam. They were allegedly soldiers. They had weapons. They had US-made backpacks. They had Vietnamese maps. Their arrest was therefore legitimate and based on objective criteria. It had nothing to do with the purported Vietnamese nationals as such. And as I just said, in any case, the telegram did not indicate that they were actually killed. Turning to another point, what's more, this allegation, in fact, does not... Do you hear me? Yes? This allegation, in fact, does not make any sense. It shows, instead, the lack of cultural knowledge of the co-prosecutors. Because even if these Jarai held Vietnamese nationality, which has not been proven, Jarai people are neither of Vietnamese race nor ethnicity. As you know, Mr. President, Your Honours, the physical features of Jarai differ significantly from that of Vietnamese, and they are an ethnic minority with a distinctive language and culture. This event, therefore, has nothing to do with the alleged racial persecution of the Vietnamese or the genocide the Vietnamese. While we're at it, nor does it have anything to do with the grave breaches of the Geneva Convention charged, since those people were objectively seen as Vietnamese soldiers conducting espionage activities on Cambodian territory. And finally, the telegram is also insufficient to prove that Nun Chi was aware of the alleged killing of those people. Indeed, as I've stated, the telegram only mentions that local authorities arrested suspected spies and could not have alerted Nun Chi. I'm sorry. The telegram only mentions that local authorities arrested suspected spies and then confiscated their weapons in what, and I must emphasize this, was a time of war with Vietnam. In such a time, such measures were fully legitimate and could not have alerted Nguyen Chia of any crimes committed against the Jarai people. Your Honours, this concludes the section of Wukhan Security Centers. And now I will finally move to Phnom Krao Security Center. And considering the dramatically limited evidence offered in relation to this site, I will be very, very brief. Your Honours, Phnom Kral Security Center was defined in the closing order 
as a complex located in autonomous sector 105 and comprising three separate facilities. Nom Kral Prison, Office K-11, and Office K-17. Now six witnesses were called to testify on site. Disturbingly, however, Mr. President, only two of them actually provided evidence directly related to Phnom Kral Security Center. All the other witnesses testified about events that occurred in Autonomous Sector 105 but that are not related to the Security Center as such. Therefore, it is clear that those witnesses' evidence is outside the scope of our case. Now, the only two witnesses who did testify that they were detained at Phnom Kral Security Center say that they were detained for a month at K-17, which, as you may recall, is one of the three facilities alleged to be at Phnom Kral. Therefore, the co-prosecutors only have evidence at all on one of the three facilities of the Security Center. They do not have evidence on Kral Prison or on Office K-11. Now, in order to try to save the relevance of the witnesses' evidence, the co-prosecutors desperately try to extend the scope of Phnom Kral Security Center to different locations. Notably, the co-prosecutors showed a keen interest, which they emphasized in court this week, on the unsworn account of civil party Sun Vut. Unfortunately, Sun Vut himself told the chamber, as you may recall, Your Honor, that he was allegedly detained at a location, and I quote, not near Nom Kral, unquote. Thus, his evidence is clearly unrelated to Phnom Kral. For that reason, the co-prosecutors shamefully pretend in their brief that Phnom Kral Security Center comprises, I quote, other buildings in the surrounding area, unquote, in addition to the three facilities specifically identified by the closing Mr. President, Your Honours, they should clearly know better than this. The closing order is what defines the scope of this trial. The co-prosecutors cannot extend it as they wish when the evidence doesn't say what they want it to. And the scope of our trial, as defined by the closing order, when it comes to Phnom Kral, is strictly limited to the events which took place at the three defined facilities. I say again, Phnom Kral Prison, Office K-11, and Office K-17. This means that you must reject all evidence that is unrelated to any of these three facilities. Even more unfortunately for the co-prosecutors, the only two witnesses who provided evidence within the scope completely undermined the co-prosecutor's case on Phnom Kral. Firstly, these two witnesses described the reasons of their arrest. They explained that they were related to Kam Phun, the Secretary of Commerce Office K-16, who was suspected of treason and who had been found dead in Phnom Penh. Moreover, 17 people related to this same Kam Phun flew to Vietnam under unclear circumstances. Mr. President, these two events, together with the escalation of the armed conflict with Vietnam, led to chaos in the autonomous sector 105. To stabilize the situation, local authorities had to take exceptional measures, including the close scrutiny of people part of Comfort's network. Thus, those two witnesses were legitimately and lawfully detained at Phnom Kral Security Center on a temporary preventive basis to give the authorities time to sort things out. Second, these two witnesses confirmed that they were released after a month. This confirms that they were kept under surveillance just for the time it took to calm the situation in the area. Nothing more. Third, importantly, 
the witnesses stated that they were never mistreated while in detention. They further described detention conditions that were con consistent with conditions in prisons in the DK at the time, and what they described clearly failed to reach the level of gravity required for a crime against humanity. And finally, Mr. President and Your Honours, none of the witnesses heard ever saw even one single killing of Kroon Kral. Some witnesses provided speculative evidence regarding people being sent out of the security centre. However, we have absolutely no evidence as to what happened to those people. They may just as likely have been released or sent to a different location. At the end of the day, there is simply no evidentiary basis to find beyond reasonable doubt that killing, extermination, or enforced disappearances occurred at Phnom Krang. Thank you, Mr. President, Your Honours. This concludes my presentation, and I'll now hand the floor to my colleague, Victor Kopi, to discuss the last security centre in our មេត្តាវិកពេសុំជម្រាបសួរលោកសេចាវក្រមលោកវិធានអាចដោយពិនិត្យពេលវេលាខ្ញុំមិនគិតថាខ្ញុំអាចបញ្ចប់បាត់ប